From WHYY and Billy Penn, it is hitting season. Hey there, podcast pals. I'm John Stolness from The Good Fight and Billy Penn. You can follow me on Twitter at John Stolness. Coming up on this episode of the podcast, a potential game changer in the National League East. The Phillies' top rival loses maybe their best player and certainly one of the very best pitchers in the game. How's that going to affect things here in what has been a very rough National League East start for just about every team in the division? Uh, we're also going to get into this game, uh, this series against the Washington Nationals this weekend in the nation's capital. Phillies take two out of three. Had a chance for the sweep on Sunday, uh, but couldn't score enough po- as enough runs. And uh, I almost said points. Like, I've never watched baseball before. You know those people who say, how many points did they score last night? I almost ran a points thing at you. Um, But the Phillies win two out of three. And so uh, a decent weekend in Washington overall. And we'll get to a few other things as well. Uh, The Marlins and Mets will laugh at them for a few minutes, too. Joining me, Justin Clue, Liz Rocher, my good pals, co-hosts here for Hit and Season. episode. This is episode number 800, by the way, everyone. So 800 episodes of this podcast. Of course, that's going back to 2015. So... So we just keep rolling right along. Elizabeth Rocher from Yahoo Sports. Follow her on Twitter at Liz Rocher. Liz, how are you? John, I'm doing great. I- I'm excited to tell anybody who's been watching watching this on uh, YouTube that soon the, the plight of uh, of me recording from my bedroom will hopefully be over. So uh, exciting for good. everyone. Liz is going to be uh, moving into a new place hopefully. pretty soon, hopefully. Yes. And, uh, yeah, the blankets and the bed and everything like that will be a yeah. thing of the past. But, you know, <laughs> I'd like love to said, say we've come a long way since uh, when I was literally podcasting from underneath a blanket. Yep. yep. In, that was uh, one of my our old... first producers told you to do that, right? Remember is that? Is that true? Yeah, I remember our, one of our first SB Nation producers basically said there was too much echo in your room and suggested, I think, that you podcast from under a blanket because we weren't doing it on on video at that point so no no i just yeah from under a blanket i podcasted and so now i'm sitting on uh my bed with a pillow and a sweater so Mm -hmm. uh i can't wait to be able to say it's been a long we've come a long way we've come a long way so we really have yeah but back i guess three or four years ago when he mentioned that i guess the unidirectional mic hadn't been invented yet uh but uh here we are lo these many years later and um mm. we have we have the technology uh, a rare and- miss from the sb nation <laughs> podcast department That's exactly right Hard i'm sorry to believe. the uh, defunct i, I believe oh, right sorry what the used to defunct. be yep the what used to be yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. We got hit with that uh, this weekend, obviously, um, on my Eagles podcast, uh, the Bleeding Green Nation podcast feed. I can address, I'm going to address that at the end, not for long, but you know, uh, that obviously was kind of a little kick in the pants uh, this this weekend for all of us who were still hanging on at SB Nation, uh, doing some uh, podcasting work. Anyway, uh, Justin Clue from Baseball Prospectus also joining us here on the podcast. Follow him on Twitter at Justin underscore Clue. He also is one uh, co- part of the co-hosting team of the Dirty Inning and absolutely happy over on our hit and season patreon justin what's going on buddy well he did it he connor brogged off to the dodgers he did <clears throat> took my advice I, can't, I honestly i was surprised how many people responded or informed me using those words specifically that connor brogged in brogged off he brogged to off the that, dodgers. <laughs> that, that phrase made an impact justin i scoffed at only, it last time but you know only i had come up with it before several hours prior to his trade away from the organization. This could have been our big t-shirt money. Instead. Yeah. Now you've got to hand it off to the Dodgers. You got to say, here you go, fellas. It's... <laughs> well, here you go. More money for you, I guess. Yeah. yeah. If only there were actual, there were Dodgers podcasts out there, you know, then they would be able to use it. <laughs> but unfortunately, no. Um, How would right, we well... have made money on a, on a nickname that only works if he's bad? See, this is why you're not invited to these development meetings, Liz. Yeah, no, no you vision. Take There's no these vision. brilliant ideas, and you say, "How would that happen?" or "Why <laughs> would that work?" And instantly, instantly, they dissolve in our hands. It's <laughs> it's less why... fun when I come around peddling reality. I know <laughs> it's not. No, and you'll. I'll thank you not to stop fun. it. Um, please, <laughs> please, and thank you. All right, uh, let's get into the show here, and. Um, I w- normally we start talking off about you know the Phillies and the weekend that they had and yes one they won two out of three 
in Washington. A kind of a, a little bit of a frustrating series from an offensive standpoint. The pitching was really good. We're going to dive into all that kind of stuff. But uh, the talk around baseball right now, and it specifically affects the Phillies, which is why we're going to lead off the show with some news of that features another team, the Atlanta Braves, is, of course, Spencer Strider. It sure looks for all the world like he's going to be out for the season here. Uh, after his last start, felt some uh, some pain in his elbow. He went to the uh, the new chief elbow pitching guy out there who, um, I think that's his official title. Uh, he's, Dr. He, James Meister, is that oh, what it was? Oh, that's what it is. Okay, yeah. yeah not, that's, not, the new, that's the new death sentence name you just don't <laughs> want to hear. Dr. James Andrews retired, if you're yeah. not aware. Uh, I, I wrote yeah, up know that, that uh, prior to the season and talked about several of the cases where, yeah, he just wound up being a name you did not want to see next to your yeah. favorite players. Well, and it, now, now there's a new one. But where is Dr. Neil L. Atrache? I mean, he just, <laughs> he just ups and vanishes now. Where, where is he? Where is he gone? Where's Dr. L gone? Do you think these guys got into the, the game for the celebrity? You know, Probably. You know, they, <laughs> Cause they, wa- they wanted to be, they wanted to have their names despised and spat upon by sports <laughs> fans. <laughs> Actually, uh, Dr. Neal now works exclusively for the Dodgers. Oh, they're getting all the money. Oh, my God. Who let this happen? Well, I think Dr. Meister works for the Rangers, right? I mean, I think both of these guys um, work for – or at least maybe he did work for the Rangers if he doesn't anymore. But anyway, he was with the Rangers at at a certain point. Anyway, um, (laughs) Spencer Strider is going to see that guy, Dr. Meister. Um, and it sure looks like he's going to need Tommy John surgery, which is a devastating blow to the Atlanta Braves. As good as the Atlanta Braves are, as good as that offense is, and it is an exceedingly good offense, an exceedingly good bullpen. That team is very, very good. But you can't lose maybe the best pitcher in baseball and not feel it. And maybe the weakest part of the Atlanta Braves has been the starting rotation. It still looked like to be a pretty good starting rotation this year. But anytime you lose a top two or three pitcher in the game – it's going to hurt. And obviously this is, he's just the latest pitcher to need this uh, surgery this year. Just been a a, a rash of them. Uh, Shane Bieber, it was also announced this weekend that the Cleveland guardians is going to need Tommy John surgery. So this is an epidemic going throughout baseball. Baseball fans have been deluged with stories all over the place, trying to figure out why this is happening. Why is this happening? Is it coming back from high school? Is it velocity? Is it the sweeper? Is it, you know, the, 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 Speed change-ups, the gripping of the baseball, no tacky stuff. Is it the pitch clock? None of that really – I mean, we, we should try and figure out what all that is. But in terms of, like, play on the field, this Spencer Strider injury could mean big things in the National League East, Justin. And so what it what it could potentially do is open the door for the Phillies. And I don't know that it necessarily means the Phillies should be considered the favorites now in the National League East. I guess the question is how much closer do you think it gets them – to the Atlanta Braves. How big a loss is this for Atlanta? The Phillies have a really good starting rotation, and the Braves had um, one of the best pitchers in the National League at the top of their rotation. As you said, there were questions about the depth that they were capable of achieving with that rotation, and now they're testing it pretty much immediately. So I think the the Strider issue that like you kind of saw forming in that first game against the Diamondbacks, he let uh, he let up uh, three runs in the first inning. So already things were starting to look a little shaky and strange, or that like something's got to be wrong if a guy like Strider is getting hit that early. Uh, but then I think in addition to the next day, which was actually even worse, when Max Freed gave up six runs in the first inning. These were signs that this rotation, you know, you find out pretty quick, oh, we don't have somebody that can keep runs off the board. Now, I don't think anybody was jumping to that conclusion just yet. It's still early. Strider is Strider. But then when you bring the health issues into it, it suddenly becomes, oh, what is this rotation without Spencer Strider? Hopefully, you know, Chris Sale is somebody they can rely on. But if you're putting hopefully in front of statements like that, you're going to get in trouble real quick because, again, it's early is is kind of bad news in this case because you got a lot of baseball left to play. Mm-hmm. Additionally, I will say, though, those two games I mentioned, the Braves won both of them. <laughs> they came back and won yeah. both times. So they are also a team that has more strengths than their weakest point. Like they are they are a team that has an offense that obviously everyone is familiar with. And then if they are able to lean on that a little harder, I mean, I don't know, they, they seem to be able to handle most instances in the regular season of uh, issues like this arising. Let's see what happens. I think you're definitely going to see them try to make an adjustment of some kind, uh, make a move of any kind. 
this is going to be an issue for them starting pitching wise, but it sure is nice to be a team that can just be like, oh, we can't, we can't shut you out and just score a couple runs. Great. Why don't we just score eight or nine runs every game and see what happens? Yeah, I mean, Liz, they, they certainly are capable of doing that. I really did think their offense would take a step back this year just because I didn't think there's no way they can replicate what they did last year. So far, they've been replicating what they did last year. But and then it, does it look even better? Like, yes, I feel like it, I, it looks better. It looks even more lights out top to bottom, no weak points. Suddenly Michael Harris is like this huge problem when he was just kind of a big problem last year. Like, yeah. why is it better? <laughs> yeah, shouldn't be better. Um, nope. Shouldn't be better. But Liz, I mean, I think this is one of those things where maybe they don't feel it until later in the season. I mean, they might be able to get by with Bryce Elder. They might be able to get by with uh, whoever else it is. They're going to mm-hmm. call up with Justin shaking his head. No, they're not going to be solved. Bryce, uh, no, not Bryce. Bryce if you put in your hopes to Bryce Elder, then yeah. you've already lost the NLDS. Right. Well, and the funny thing here too, Liz, is that if you wanted to go out and trade for somebody at the trade deadline, Shane Bieber was going to be the best guy available and he's not there anymore. So the Marlins may move on from Jesus Lazardo. He'll probably get traded at the trade deadline but i I was listening to a couple of guys on mlb network today and they were essentially saying braves don't have enough in the farm system now to compete with the other teams that would want to go after him so there may not be a solution at the trade deadline for for atlanta so the question i guess to you is can do you think atlanta can they still win the division with a spencer strider less guy at the top of the rotation with that offense oh yeah if only because they're the Braves. I feel like they're they no longer have like a, a Dodgers esque like un unfillable a bottomless hole of of young players to just throw at every problem. But you know it, their offense will slow down at some point. But I also think that it's they're the Braves. Their offense does look better. Like Michael Harris spent his first weekend, I think, beefing with with uh, Phillies fans on Twitter. Some more than others that we know personally. Maybe <laughs> a little bit, somewhat. Um, yes. So I would be. I'm. I. It makes me feel a little bit better that there's a. Uh, you know. You could see a little bit of daylight through the the steel curtain. That mm-hmm. is the Braves, um, but I won't. I'm not going to believe that they're going to be affected by it until I see it because they always <laughs> seem to find a way to get by. Like last year, they managed to have almost everything, but you know I, they I mean, still couldn't make it. So I, I'll be. I don't know. I I still have a, a sinking feeling that they're just going to be as good. I mean, let's not forget they also have a bullpen. They also have a really, really good bullpen. Yeah, like they they're, do. They're, they're, uh, Stry- where the problem with losing Strider is that you're losing kind of like that that big calling card from the weakest part of what they had. Like the, in their weakest part, they still had the best one of the best guys in the league. They had a Cy Young contender, one of the top two Cy Young contenders leading off their rotation, which was, again, considered one of their the, the weakest component of their roster. But, I mean, if you saw the game today, Chris Sale got the start. You know, goes five and two, five and a third, and then the relievers come in and they don't allow really anything to happen yeah. for the rest of the game. And then they just for fun got home runs from three different guys. You know, so they have the dimensions to to pull this off. Though I will say, you know, we're giving the Braves a lot of credit here, and it's deserved. But this humanizes them. I think this yeah. does They're really. Not no, this brings them down a bit, and it's it's hard to really put them and the Phillies in the same conversation just based on what we've seen so far where the Phillies have just struggled to hit the ball hard in moments where you really want them to do so. Whereas the Braves are just like um, the middle part of our lineup just like kind of went off today. Tomorrow it'll be the top part, you know, tomorrow the the number nine guy will hit two homers. Like it's, you know, it's whatever that being said this, yeah, this kind of humanizes them and, and kind of brings them closer to, to, I think the Phillies and, and makes something like winning the division for the Phillies a little more possible because, you know, it almost goes without saying, but Spencer Strider is a huge part of this team and losing him for any amount of time is going to impact their chances. Now I saw a lot of Braves, a couple of Braves fans who saw that Strider was put on the 15 day injured list and saw that as a good thing. Like, Oh, uh... well, Hey, 
that's not so bad. And of course, I had to be told, no, Those that people actually don't have is... functioning brains, do they? No, yeah, that's, that's not fair. Not a, <laughs> that's, not <laughs> that's not a sign. That's not a sign <laughs> no. of, uh, of good news at all, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, because, yeah, again, speaking objectively, I don't want to compliment the Braves too much here, but speaking objectively, Spencer Strider is a cool young pitcher. He, he really is. He is a fun guy to watch. The biggest issue is that he does what he does in a Braves uniform. Yeah. Uh, but that being said, the Braves lost the strongest part of their weakest part. That's what I've been tr- struggling to say. Yeah, and that's like that, really going to impact their chances to win the the, the, the division. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't. I think it does bring the Phillies closer. I think it brings them quite a bit closer. I think Max Fried struggling early certainly should have Atlanta fans nervous. He's been really beat up in his first two starts. He gave up six runs uh, in the first inning here over the weekend in his last start and got you know beat up by the Phillies. Now. He should have gotten out of an inning in which he gave up a bunch of runs on that awful missed call by the home plate umpire in the in the Phillies game, uh, that second game of the season. But that's um, part of the game. Part of the game. Part of the game. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Got to deal with it. Got to roll with it. You yeah. know. And honestly, without Strider in that rotation, I don't think they have a pitcher that I that the Phillies couldn't eventually well, that's, beat. That's what I'm saying. Spencer Strider has specifically been a Phillies killer over these last few years. And so in that regard, the Phillies can go into some of these series knowing that they can get to every one of those Braves pitchers. Um, You know, we'll see how they do with Chris Sale. They haven't really ever faced Chris Sale before, but they know that they don't, Spencer Strider was a stopper for them, especially in series against the Phillies in the regular season. Obviously the Phillies have had a little bit more success against him in the postseason. They've never hit him around, but they've managed to beat him uh, when they've faced him the last couple seasons, with the exception of the, you know, Reese Hoskins bat spike game. So what this is really going to do, what's going to be really interesting to see here with Atlanta is as the season goes along, if Bryce Helder, if Bryce Elder is called up and he's the fifth guy, and they have another guy, um, uh, Shame Schuster. I, I had the depth chart in front of me. Now I can't remember his name. He pitched in the playoffs against the Phillies last year. Throws hard, but has you know was was hit around quite a bit. They don't have somebody to re- to replace him. So that's going to affect how much the bullpen gets used, how often the bullpen gets taxed during the course of a season. So it may not affect them much here in April, but as you go to June and July and August, like how much is that bullpen, which is very good, how much are they going to get worked? How much are they going to get used? How much is it going to be stressful to the offense if they know if they know now we have to carry the team? Will that affect the offense a little bit? And can the Phillies then, the other side of the coin here is can the Phillies take advantage of this? And that's always a big question when it comes to the Phillies. Mm-hmm. Can they take advantage of soft parts in their schedule? Can they take advantage of some of these some of these little uh, mystical benefits that that befall that befall teams every once in a while? The door's open for the Phillies to take this division. Now, it's open, it's been open. <laughs> Can will they, they walk, walk through, through it? it? <laughs> will they walk through uh, it, or will they aim wrong and accidentally walk into the open door itself? <laughs> they just keep walking into, into the, 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 door, wall. the wall next to the door, <laughs> just like a, then, just like one of those wind-up toys, just like stuck against a wall, just repeats and repeats and repeats. Accidentally get like a chair stuck under the knob. And you're like, well, how did this yeah. happen? <laughs> <laughs> the whole time um, they can't stop themselves from just walking into the door. The whole time. we have to remember in this conversation that the Phillies we're watching now are, if historical trends continue, not the Phillies we're going to be watching in uh, in a couple of months. Or maybe even a couple of weeks. Uh, you know, th- there is a more competitive version of this team that we have seen that is just, it's it's hard to believe when you're watching them and they're at this point and they're just coming out. And I, I feel, I, I know we're going to talk about it, but like stuff like, oh, they're not fully back yet. Oh, they're not fully awake yet. Oh, they haven't gotten out of spring training yet. Okay, you get maybe a two-week grace period for that kind of stuff. The base running issues we're watching them commit that's on another level to me. That's not even lack of preparedness. That's lack of awareness. You know, that that's lack yeah. of baseball IQ. And that's a lot more troublesome. That being said, if you're if you're if you want to take advantage of of the kind of opportunity we're talking about that like, hey, look, the Braves are you know, they've been they've been humanized and the rest of these teams don't look like they're able to compete then look, you can wait You can wait to become that team that's a little more competitive, that has, a, has its head on straight, that's hitting more line drives, that doesn't have, you know, a, a, as a weak a plate approach, that has more solid contact from guys like Trey Turner and Nick Castellanos uh, coming through at, like, important times, that has 
runners in scoring position coming into score. That is guys who aren't getting picked off first base or getting trapped between second and third in big moments or button the ball in the air or trying to bunt and missing it. All this stuff. All this stuff is still going to be a part of their game. It's just they're going to be a little more in the zone and, and you know, in used to playing with each other and they find their groove and that's the team. That's the team that can take advantage of this. The problem is, will that actually still be an opportunity or will the Braves just kind of like thrive for, for no reason without a pitching, a starting pitching staff and just like their offense is going to be like, we can do this. We can take the ball and run with it. We saw the Phillies play some of their best ball without Bryce Harper. So can the Braves do the same thing without a star? It's tough to, it's tough to say absolutely not. It's, it's really tough to right. count the Braves out. I do want to say, I think the word you're looking for, Justin, might be vulnerable. Humanized makes me think of them as humans, and I would rather <laughs> avoid doing that. I feel like vulnerable mm. is a better word. They've been made vulnerable a little bit. They're showing their soft underbelly. Yes. Uh, I like the soft underbelly. Yes. Mm -hmm. One of the little, you know, one of the little pieces of armor has fallen off. Yeah. But the question just becomes, how quickly are the Phillies going to become that team? Like, right. How, right. how long are we going to play this game? Well, I mean, that's the thing. The, the Braves have shown a vulnerability. I mean, that's that's totally true. Will it affect their confidence? I, it, I doubt it. But no. things, can, things can happen during the course of a long season. And the Phillies have to take advantage of opportunities when, when they present themselves. The rest of the division is gross. The, the Marlins <laughs> and the Mets and the Nationals, it's going to be a fascinating race to the bottom disgusting. for the rest of the National League East. It is a disgusting display with those three teams. The Nationals less so really than the Marlins. The Marlins and the Mets are laughing stocks right now. The Nationals at least... There, there's some there's some stuff there. You know, you go in to play the Nationals, you know, you expect to win two out of three. You expect to win those series. But they're going to they're gonna play tough. They're going to play hard. They're not going to fall all over themselves and do ridiculously stupid things. I mean, they certainly aren't, do not play a clean game of baseball most of the time. But the Nationals are a respectable opponent right now, even though they Let's, may not win a whole lot of games. I want to talk the about the Marlins for just a bit. I'm sorry. <laughs> if you want to talk about the Nationals, we can keep doing that. But I no, want to talk the, about the Marlins a little bit. The Nationals are just, you know, a, a rebuilding team with some of their like, what, like two or th maybe three of their young, exciting players, like currently up with the team, and they've plugged a lot of cheap free agents mm -hmm. into other roles who aren't going to be there. Like, I think the Nationals are totally fine with where they are right now. They are always just a little proud of themselves, anyway. But like, I do think they are. They are currently in a state where they're like, yeah, yeah. This is this is pretty know, much by yeah. design. They're self aware. We know what we yeah. are, you know, and that's okay. We're we're building. Yeah. Right. But like like Liz, the Marlins avoiding the 0 and ten start on, on Sunday by by salvaging a win. Salvaging. What they've done with it Kim barely Ng, matters. Oh my goodness gracious. Go ahead and talk about the Marlins because well, it really is something let's else. Go back a little bit and look at the Marlins as a team. If we start with their offseason, after they made the playoffs, they made the playoffs this past year, right? They, they yes yes uh and they stunk and we beat them in the wild card round yes, it was very good right. they so, did not win a game mm -mm. Mm -mm. so what happened after that after making the playoffs um they decided they wanted to take their incredibly successful trailblazing executive kimming and uh put another executive between her and the owner Makes total sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, effectively demoting her and giving her a new boss. Uh, Who wouldn't be she, excited about that? Yeah. yeah, exactly. So she left, um, and they hired. Uh, a guy who I actually wrote, I, I wrote about him. I can't tell you what his name was. I apologize. Whoever their new GM is, he's a young guy, and he proceeded to do absolutely nothing. They did nothing. Hmm. They did ne almost negative things. They lost players, did not replace them with anyone. They start the season uh, a one and nine. And today, the Marlins confirmed that they are ending their uh, manager, Skip Schumacher's, contract this year. He will be a free agent after the end of this year. So they made him a lame duck in the yep. middle of the season. Uh, not even middle. It is game 10 today. Wow. They decided what is the... to, and this was almost certainly something that they knew they were going to do. but Because they, they've got a whole new regime, new owners. So wow, they, what, is, what is the thinking behind doing that? Why would a team be like, oh, and by the way, you're done. 
at the end of this year? Like, what what is what do they gain from that? Um, nothing. They actually. <laughs> it feels like this is real life major league. Only there isn't a lovable group of ragtag, you know, can doers, you know, screw up little, you know, light screw ups and whatnot. Uh, they're just baseball players who cannot hack it. And it's going to be miserable. And the person who owns their team does not care. The way the, the way it's being explained, I'm sorry to interrupt, but the way it's being explained is the new GM, whose name is Peter Bendix. Thank you, Peter Bendix. I knew it had a weird letter in it somewhere. Right. So Schumacher was obviously a Kimming hire. Now he mm -hmm. comes in and he essentially is going to want, they're going to sell everybody off this summer. Like it's going to be a complete sell off. They, they the team. already have mostly. Right, so they're gonna they're gonna sell off Jesus Lazardo and everybody else on that team who possibly Jazz Chisholm may get traded. I mean, lots of different guys may get traded. It could be an absolute decimation of the roster. Schumacher's not going to want to be around anyway. He may have gotten wind of what the plans were and just said, "Yeah, let's void my 2025 year. I don't need to be here for this." But Bendix wants likely to hire his own manager. He doesn't want to hire. He doesn't want to keep Someone Schumacher sucks. aboard. Someone right. who sucks instead of some guy who might have made it work with decent players. Someone well, someone who who's willing to be for. on board with the team bottoming out rather than a manager who made the postseason last year and expects the team to progress, you know, like a normal baseball team would. What's incredible is that if the next person, anyone who calls this a rebuild, should be taken out and pointed at and laughed at in front of everyone because – you cannot have a rebuild unless you were somewhere to begin with. And making the playoffs for a single year as a wild card team that won zero games is not something you rebuild from. It's something you keep building on. If you dismantle what you just had, what are you doing and why? I'm sorry. I'm so angry at this and there's no reason to be. But I mean, like, it's tough for them to, uh, they're a to baseball convince anyone team. they're they're a competitive franchise that they're trying, that they're trying to win. I mean, I forgot they acquired Tim Anderson. He used to be one of uh, me and Liz's favorite players yeah. until yeah. like the stretch. He just, you know, wasn't doing it anymore. Injuries, and then they Injuries, hired uh, yeah. Tony La Russa over in Chicago, I guess specifically yeah. maybe to make, make Tim Anderson uncomfortable. I right. feel they're like, how's this going to work? Oh, it's just not, it's just not going to work. Okay, nope. fine. Uh, yeah, and I, I don't know how the Mar Marlins will keep up the guise of being any kind of like, oh yeah, no, we're like definitely, we're, we're we're in it to win it. Like we're definitely we want to win baseball games and hopefully more of them. I mean, the assumption like we're already saying when things get to that point, it'll be just yeah, the Marlins just doing what the Marlins have always done. Yeah. A little bit of this is what people were afraid of with the Phillies wild card flag that they would get a little bit of success and be like that was enough and never yeah. do it again. This is actually that. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and yeah, can you that's... imagine what would have happened? Like, I, I love how people were legitimately scared of that, because in no universe could I imagine that happening, because Phillies fans are too demanding. Like, there aren't enough. The Marlins have not been good enough for long enough as a team, even though they're not very old, to actually build this type of fan base. They haven't been good. They haven't even been good bad for long enough like the Phillies were there's just nothing there and they have no one to hold them accountable because the fans are the only ones in any way who can do that you know and right. they do that with their wallets and they're doing it by not showing up but that also means they're not caring at least right. for the Phillies in that position the fans won't go but they will yell at you all the same yeah, and I think you know the Phillies have are already pot committed to making this like a, a World Series, do you know do or die? Oh, yeah, of course. You know, so so there was never any worry that like oh they got the wild card flag up there now they can rest on their laurels and and, and it, it, that's that was never a serious thought. I know a lot of the reasoning was well it cheapens the other flags. Oh yeah, stop. Just I don't want to go. I don't want to relitigate that argument. But <laughs> um, you know, so so the Phillies have an opportunity here. This all has to do with the Phillies. I know we haven't really talked about the Phillies here for the first 25 minutes of this show, but this all has to do big picture with the Phillies because you've got a Mets team that's also cratering. They can't hit the broad side of a barn. The Marlins, you're, if, if failed to mention another Tommy John guy, Yuri Perez, 
is oh, yeah. going to be out for the year with Tommy John surgery. One of the other, and Sandy Alcantara is already out for the season with Tommy John surgery. So, I mean, you've just got one injury after another with the Marlins. That team is dead. Cross them off. Cross off the Mets. Cross off the Marlins. You can probably cross off the Nationals as a as a real problem so it's a two-team race and we kind of knew it would be a two-team race but now it's really a two-team race there should be an, op an ample opportunity here for the phillies to really challenge atlanta now for the division the gap has gr had gotten a lot smaller and so you have this series in washington this weekend the phillies take the first two games they have a chance to go for the sweep on sunday can't get the job done the offense was frustrating all all weekend long even in the victories the offense was frustrating to watch but they did enough because the pitching carried them through this weekend. So let's talk about the pitching first before we talk about the offense and the base running, which was infuriating during the course of the weekend, even in winning two out of three. They got a really good start. Check, check that. They got a good start from Aaron Nola in the, in the series opener on Friday. He didn't have his best stuff, but limited the damage, got it done, got through it, got to the, you know, gave him some innings. Perfectly good start for, for Aaron Nola on, on Friday. On Saturday, Ranger Suarez came out. He had another excellent start, did a good job with the Nationals lineup. And then on, on Sunday, you had Christopher Sanchez, who danced between the raindrops, couldn't make five innings, but he did give up uh, just a couple of runs before exiting. Unfortunately, he had to use the bullpen quite a bit uh, in this game. So neither of these pitchers went deep. You had to use a lot of bullpen arms during the course of this weekend, which can be problematic now as we, we move into the week. But they got two out of three. Disappointing, though, Justin, that they weren't able to get this third game and get the sweep. You want to take advantage of this. Talk about the soft underbelly. This next portion of the schedule is just filled with teams that the Phillies should be able to take advantage of. Like, this is an opportunity to make hay on, on the schedule against the Atlanta Braves and kind of move forward. Let's talk about the pitching. Your thoughts on the starting pitching and the bullpen this weekend. Really good efforts. Who really impressed you this weekend? Well, it would have to be Suarez, I think. Like, Nola had some work to do. He had to cr climb out of that game two hole. And uh, you're right. He did. He was a perfectly good Aaron Nola start. No runs allowed. I mean, really, I, I think that's that's got to be a close contender to the, one of the best performances of the weekend. You know, the four walks, I think, is what's going to jump out to people. The command issues, that's obviously, you know, something that's got to get under control. But the fact that he was able to at least be bailed out in situations where he might be approaching trouble, where we know in the past he has struggled, he gets in his own head, and he just starts to implode. We didn't see that, you know. And we saw that uh, he was able, you know, he was able to go five and two-thirds, shut out innings, Fine. I will take that as an Aaron Nola start. Totally. The Phillies need to start racking up wins, which is why today I didn't want to let him off the hook. You're like, yeah, you got the series one, but Christopher Sanchez is going out there. Like, you know, you're, you're probably going to have to give him a little more uh, offensive boost. You're going to have to be, you know, hitting Mackenzie Gore, who throws a lot of fastballs and the Phillies can hit fastballs. But part of the problem was Sanchez was leaving a lot of sinkers down the middle. Like that was just... That was yeah. it. There were very, it was the most hittable thing in D.C. since Ted Cruz's face. <laughs> I thought of that earlier today. Is that good? That's well good. executed. Right. Good one. Yeah. I don't care uh, what yeah. side of the political spectrum you're on. That's funny. It's just funny right there. It was uh, definitely, definitely not Sanchez's best stuff. But like when your number five starter goes out there, you got to be prepared to deal with somebody who's not throwing the throwing the best stuff. Yeah. So I, I definitely I think this weekend, probably in all four, all three of these games, you could come down on the defense on the offense. But Ranger Suarez went six innings, you know, in his in his start, four yeah. hits, two earned runs, four strikeouts. He allowed the home run. I mean, again, I think you can say of all three of these starts. They did their job, you know, even even Sanchez to an extent as a number five guy. It's not that he has more leeway. He just has lower expectations. Uh, he, he's going to throw he's going to make starts like that where it's it's just not working. You know, the, the pitches he, he has come to rely on just were looking hittable to a, one of the more mid offenses in the National League. But in Suarez's case, he came out and gave him six innings. Uh, Thompson was able to go to guys like Hoffman and Soto and Alvarado who are starting to really find their groove and they were able to carry it the rest of the way. But Suarez looked like he had his composure. He made a couple of defensive plays. I mean, he, he made a typical Rangers Suarez start, which is kind of what we need to see more of. We need, we need to see more of these good pitchers making starts that are typical for them because they're good pitchers. Like, Blah, 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 the whole conversation. But Aaron Nola is a good pitcher. Like, he is a good – he wouldn't have the deal he has if he wouldn't – if he wasn't a good pitcher, he wouldn't be in as many conversations about pitching in the National League if it wasn't a good pitcher. So we we know that he is capable of being a good pitcher, and he's got to make more starts that are typical of that. 
Wheeler's got to keep doing what he's doing, and Suarez has to pitch like he pitched uh, this weekend, where he came out, he gave him at least six innings, he fielded his position, he was unrattled and unbothered by most of the uh, events of the day, and, you know, he just pitched a, a solid game that gave them the opportunity to win. Yeah, that's that's what it's got to be. It's got to be typical to look good. Yeah, I forget on Friday the Phillies only gave up two hits as a team. Uh, as a two hit, you know, two hit shutout by by Aaron Nola and and the relievers uh, Matt Strom went an inning in the third, uh, Sir Anthony Dominguez and Jose Alvarado uh, each pitched an inning in that game. And then in the game on Saturday, Liz, uh, the bullpen once again did a great job. Now Suarez gave them six innings, so you only needed three innings. But Jeff Hoffman comes in, gets another five out relief appearance from him. Jeff Hoffman, I was Jeff a little Hoffman. concerned, man, Bingo. he was gonna fall back to earth after kind of surprising us all last year, but he looks great. And Gregory Soto has been a very good kind of lefty specialist situational guy so far. I mean, he comes in and he's able to kind of, you're not asking him to do too much just right now. And he's been very good here to start the season. He has yet to be scored on. Jose Alvarado came in and uh, the umpire was a little bit iffy with the strike zone and, and was, you know, had some with the save, he managed to get it done, but threw a few more pitches than I think anybody wanted. And then in the aftermath of the Chris Sanchez start, you had Junior Marte coming in, did really well in this game. He came in in a difficult spot, gave up a sacrifice fly. It was the go-ahead run, but really limited the damage. He pitched an inning in two-third. And then you had Strom another inning, Sir Anthony Dominguez another inning. They didn't give up any runs. The bullpen, Liz, this weekend was not charged with a single run. <laughs> and so it's after that rough start against the Atlanta Braves, this Phillies bullpen starting to pitch as advertised. And I think, again, we're looking big picture. The pitching staff, you get performances like this from the starters in the bullpen. They are The Phillies are going to be successful even when the offense is struggling. Yes. These are, I think, especially Hoffman, Strom, and Soto, that trio. Did they all pitch on the same day? I think it might have been Alvarado, but they're all they all represent like significant Phillies success stories and, you know, steps forward for their development and scouting staff, because Hoffman is a mixture of scouting and, you know, development pitching, you know, their pitching department, because they found a guy who they thought they could help and could be good for them. And lo and behold, it actually turned out they turned him into this guy. They're mm -hmm. able to, they've been able to take Matt Strom and turn him into something spectacular because he had, I think, some up and down results and they've been able to coax some stability out of him. It's been, I, I, I see a weekend like this and I, it's, it feels like such a long road. We've traveled to get here. We remember 2020 and we wonder how was this bullpen ever? going to be like it was hard to see a way out through the the forest of of crappy crappy closers and yeah. the Jenmar Gomez's of the time uh but you know it, it's so they're they've been so successful that they're now a destination and relievers want to go there which is only going to help the Phillies have like a pick of who's good. Like, I trust them now if someone goes down, they'll be able to find someone to take their place because that's what they did last year. Look at the, the success stories that they found, the good guys they found mid-season. You know, it's... Uh, I, I can't wait to see what happens the rest of the season um, and how, since they started off so well, how they handle the inevitable bumps in the road that will come along. Yeah, your bullpen's going to run into trouble at times, uh, especially like the more you lean on it. But Rob Thompson's obviously almost seemingly too too committed to his rest schedule for relievers. But it's just nice that you can hit that sixth inning sweet spot with some of these starters. You can aim for that, you know, and then hopefully if the pitch count's good, if they're not sweating it, you can leave them out there to eat as many innings as possible. But it's it is an absolutely huge boon for this team to have a bullpen that they can rely on. I mean, I shake my head at Jeff Hoffman. It's out of impressiveness, not out of disgust, like yeah. some people. Uh, but it's more like a nod of appreciation more than a shake of, of right. Like, like I'm like I'm smiling exists. sagely. Oh, yeah, you're just shaking like, your head like how did a slight he wink do of that? the eye. Right. Yeah, yeah, like he yeah. strikes out the last batter in an inning and he sees me standing over the dugout He's... going like this, but then I like fade away like a ghost in the wind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but Jeff Hoffman, 
Four games, four and a third. He's allowed two hits and two walks. Yikes. No runs. Struck out six. Great I mean, stuff. these... This is this is yeah. This is exactly and like opening day was discouraging for all the reasons we 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 recall. But when we're talking about this team uh, matching up with the Braves, especially now in this recontextualized NL East, this bullpen is something that is going to be huge for them to be able to rely on. And you know, we talked about Gregory Soto and how you're always just a little bit nervous when it's Gregory Soto, but he is right up there with Hoffman so far this season. Yeah. Four games, only two and two thirds innings, but he hasn't allowed any runs either. And like the longer you can do that, the longer you can put that put off that bad inning, the better for the Phillies. Because then, and then like like you're saying, Junior Marte, last year he was not one of the the arms that you could you, he came into a game and you thought, okay, yeah, they're getting out of this. He wasn't a guy that Rob Thompson would go to in in the high leverage moments. He was somebody to go to when like you know it's, maybe it's the middle of the game, starter came out early, or you know we're down we're down by a couple more than we wanted to be at this point. But now. He has also looked like an effective reliever, you know, again, very early, but uh, that is very encouraging to see as well. He's made it into five games already yeah. and hasn't allowed a run. I mean, he's pitched more than Jeff Hoffman. So that is that is a positive development. And to Liz's point that this is a place where pitchers can come to get better. That is an also a, a huge strength of a huge strength for the Phillies is that somebody like Marte can come back and look like a more effective reliever from last year. And suddenly the bullpen gets a little deeper. Yeah, and it's why you kind of are interested anytime the Phillies make a trade like moving on from Connor Brogdon and you bring back this Benoni Robles kid who's 23. He apparently mm -hmm. strikes out a bunch of guys. He's got he's got a big arm, but he has trouble commanding the baseball. Look at what the Phillies have done with guys like Christopher Sanchez. That's a guy you would describe that way um, before they got him to kind of slow things down and get his command. And now they're trying to work on his velocity to bring it back up when, now that they've gotten that part figured out. Uh, but Jose Alvarado obviously was a guy they were able to turn into one of the most dominant weapons coming out of the bullpen in baseball and he's a guy who couldn't find the strike zone with a map and a magnifying glass so you just you, you have confidence that the team can start to develop these guys the thing that worries you about the bullpen is that you can't expect the starters to go seven or eight innings every time out so what you'd like to have is you like to have the offense win some more comfortable games like have the offense provide some more Contribute. runs to that. <laughs> well that's all we weren't talking about the offense yet so i didn't no, mention I just, that i just saving them for last kids that's Can't all you? um yeah i see what i did i i, I sucked him in with the lure mm. of candy and now and now comes the homework that's what we're doing here so you have um with this offense they're not allowing the phillies you guys are skeptical of that analogy. The eyes, I think the you eyes might have been looking all for medicine. Is that what you were looking for? Because you said a homework, and I thought we were doing a Mary Poppins. That would have been better. Full of sugar. Because then, like, been a homework. Analogy. Like, what is the homework here? <laughs> I just was thinking of something unpleasant. Like, candy, candy, candy. Now, here's math. You know, that's kind of what I was thinking of. But <laughs> someone, Is someone giving you homework, John? No, we give the, the children homework. That's Not why everyone I'm, I'm, hates I'm, math. I mean, I, I don't like it. Everyone hates math. Every, <laughs> everyone hates math. It's I a have universal family truth. family members that love math. It depends don't lie. on math. No. I don't know what to tell you. I like shapes. You know, if it's if it's math math with shapes, I'm I'll sit down and let's go over circumferences. Like a three let's do year old, it. I enjoy large, bright shapes and pointing shapes and at colors. them. Shapes and colors. Identifying them. <laughs> Blue. This is circle. That's math. That's good math. I don't know what everybody's <laughs> complaining about here. All right, so candy and medicine. Let's let's go that way. Although I've, kids' medicine now mostly tastes like candy, but we're just going to move on from the analogy. Um, the John, are you taking kids' medicine and doing homework? Shh. <laughs> you it's fine. Remember how terrible Robitussin tasted? I'm sorry. It I really just was have terrible. To ask. It was awful. It was really yes. The worst. Robitussin cough medicine was the worst, and it's still I not great for adults. But like kids' medicine, it's I'm not kidding. It's it's like you're drinking like a sugar packet. It, they make it so good for the kids. Like, oh, can I have my ibuprofen? It's like, okay. I mean, like, <laughs> it's just not, you know, like, you know, when they're coming in from playing and they just want, you know, ibuprofen. But anytime they have a fever or headaches, mm -hmm. like, do I get to have ibuprofen? It's just so good. Uh, my mom never got out of bed today, Dad. Where's the ibuprofen? <laughs> It's a little weird when I go to my wife and she has to squirt it into my mouth because <laughs> I've got a headache. But um, and normally you need like 55 ounces of it, but it, mm -hmm. it works, you know, if you get enough. My um, wife puts it in cheese or I spit it out. <laughs> that's right. Where I like are to we? Take it in, Offense. Yeah, yogurt, yogurt and ice cream are good ones, too. Yogurt and ice cream are good mm. ones. Yeah, we've all. Got well, I just don't, I don't I don't want to talk about the Phillies offense. I mean, I have <laughs> thoughts on them, but 
frankly. I'd rather talk about Roman Tessin and Diamond Tap, kids. I want to do what the Phillies offense would do and stay silent. <laughs> Disappear. Oh, there it is. There's a hit and season podcast, and there's no hit and season going on with the Phillies right now, friends. Um, it's that's the thing. You would like to see some less high leverage innings from that that for this team to play for this bullpen to pitch through because Rob Thompson really does have to really figure out. Okay, I can use this guy for an inning and get one out here. And you know, if you're up like eight to two, you, you can run a guy out there like they did uh, with Ricardo Pinto uh, a few nights ago and and afford to get three innings out of a guy or or you know two innings out of a guy out of the, you know, number six or seven or eight guy in your bullpen and not have to worry about, you know, going to Sir Anthony and when am I, can I use Alvaro? I got to stay away from Soto. We used him three nights in a row or whatever it is. So the offense plays a role in how good this pitching staff is going to be as well. And even though they won uh, the first two games of this series, it was still kind of a rough showing from the offense. Harper did have a good series this weekend. Five hits, two doubles, had an RBI. Uh, JT Real Muto had a good series as well. He hit a home run for the Phillies on Saturday after the Phillies intentionally walked Bryce Harper. He had the big blow on Saturday, the, the, the three-run home run that put him up four to nothing. Edmundo Sosa hit a home run, a solo shot for the Phillies on Sunday. Um Real Muto, we should really kind of talk about Real Muto because it, he had a down year offensively last year, never really got it going, but the team really seemed optimistic that he was going to be back this year. And Rob Thompson has been batting him clean up. It's important to have a guy in this lineup that can protect Bryce Harper in the lineup. And JT Real Muto on Saturday did that by hitting the three run home run. Didn't have a hit on Sunday, but really very few players on, on the team did. Liz, JT Real Muto as the team's cleanup hitter. I'm not sold on it as as like the he's going to be the big protection, but right now in terms of right-handed hitters on this team, he is by far this team's best hitter from the right-handed side of the plate and it's encouraging to see him hitting well here in the early going. Completely. Uh I think some of some of this him hitting cleanup I, I mean I'm surprised to see it if only because it is a change in the lineup and Rod Thompson is allergic it feels to that. I think in a less extreme way than we've seen in the past, but he l loves things to be the way that they were yesterday. Uh, so I am, I would like to see him be flexible if Real Muto stops producing and protecting Bryce Harper, but it's really encouraging at this point to see him doing that. Cause last year it felt sometimes at least, especially when there were runs to get, when there were runs to bring in, Rumuto just disappeared. He was just sort of gone. Oh, double plays. Double plays. All the time. Pop-ups with runners on third and less than two outs. It like, was rough. I think that's part of the complaint from last year is that it felt really bad because there were a lot of opportunities for him to score runs and bring runs in, and he just did not do that very often. So it yeah. is incredibly encouraging early on to see him already – changing the narrative from last year already sort of taking control of things you know because the philly need a driver they need someone at least to to hit a home run every now and then you know whose name is not bryce harper or i guess edmundo sosa today so right well well especially from the right hand side of the plate mm. and, and the phillies have really gotten not much from uh well it, Nick Castellanos and Johan Rojas have been utter black holes uh, from the right-hand side of the plate, Justin. Trey Turner had a couple extra base hits this weekend. Maybe he's starting to find his swing a little bit. Alex Bohm had a triple uh, in the series, too, which was a big hit. So the Phillies are getting a little bit of offense, a little bit more in this series against a weaker pitching staff in the Nationals than they had faced in their first two series. But overall, still, this team's not getting, not delivering with runners in scoring position. They're not hitting the ball well enough for extra base hits. And a lot of this is coming from the right-hand side of the plate. I think Schwarber's been fine. I think Harper's largely been fine. He's been quiet, but has popped with a couple of big games. Bryson Stott has struggled so far here in the early going as well to, to find his swing. There's just, you know, a lot of unevenness by this by this offense. But w this is not a surprise. Like, they, they this is how they've come out of the gate every year these last two years, and they do find it. It's just really frustrating. But I think I, I just need to stop getting worked up about this offense not not coming through in these in some of these spots because I'm just spinning my tires. Like they they just they are who they are. I've been saying it all off season. If you like the 2023 Phillies, you're gonna love the 2024 Phillies. And man, <laughs> this team is a carbon copy of itself year after year. 
Yeah, I mean, it really is, except, you know, the, when, when something changes notably enough, we're able to talk about it like you were just talking about JT Real Muto. I mean, like you yeah. said, he took a step back last year. Even his defensive metrics took a step back last year. Uh, his strikeout and walk ratio was more further, uh, more far apart than it had ever, ever been or had been in recent memory. So to see him come out this year and he's hitting the ball hard and he's hitting the ball squarely and he's making pay, pitchers pay for taking yeah. up too much of the plate. Uh, Rob Thompson was saying that when he's putting the lineup together, he wants Bohm and Stott 5-6 because he likes how they're able to hit with like guys on base. And now he's got Real Muto in the cleanup spot, and he's doing the same thing. And he's like, and now we got these three guys right in a row who can all you know get on base. Uh, in the case of Stott, you know, he's like you're saying, he's not fully uh, a part of that yet. I would say he, he's yeah. uh, he's still somebody who's looking to find his swing, but that's what makes Real Muto's success uh, even better. You know, he's shortened his leg kick, he's getting his foot down more consistently, and I think that's kind of key for him. You'd think a guy who refuses to not play. Uh, wouldn't st struggle with inconsistencies in his swing, but like there's a lot of moving parts that go into it, yeah. and you were starting to see that come apart last year as he's entering the mid his mid 30s, you know. So uh, to see him able to come out this season and start off as consistently as he is, having made the adjustments he's made, that's going to be really helpful for this lineup because, as you're saying, most of these guys take about a month or two to figure out where they keep the bats and. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not, again, you don't have to be surprised by it to be irritated by it. Sure. Like sure. today, like I said, I really wasn't going to let them off the hook for dropping this game. This was a winnable game against a beatable team. It's pretty actually inexcusable, even with your number five starter going, uh, that you let this game get away. And it is, it comes down to the offense. You know, when, when you're getting what, five hits playing the nationals, you get five guys making solid contact. Two of them are from Edmund, Edmundo Sosa. Who doesn't even yeah. play every day? Like what? What? What's what's going on out there? Like this is this can't be an issue, and it's going to factor into what we were talking about before with this team's ability to capitalize on another team's vulnerability, a team that was viewed as completely invincible coming into the season. So I think I just wow, I think I just got all the way to the playoffs from the seed of JT Real Muto looking better. It's at great the stuff, yeah. Oh, goodness. Perfect. But <laughs> in any case, that's what makes that difference. So important because this is a team that comes out and is the same so much of the time. That difference that Real Muto is a is a bat that's that you can't just walk Bryce Harper to get to, as he literally proved against the Nationals. That is a that is a big difference for this team, even though the, you know they've still had a very soft and disappointing beginning to the season. Phillies as a team, 21st in baseball with a 238 batting average uh, with runners in scoring position here so far this year. Um, I will say, I think um, I've seen this, the walk rate is actually up a little bit this year and their chase rate is down by about 3% from last year, which is decent. So they're just making weak contact a lot of the times and, and Johan Rojas at the bottom of the lineup again. If, if the rest of the lineup was was hitting better, you could hide him a little bit. It's could it's you? a really rough watch. It's he and Castellanos are automatic outs right now. They are like automatic outs. It's it. I Tough. didn't want to have to land on that spot, but like that's that's what's going on. Like that's that's two spots in the lineup where you're just getting nothing, nothing, nothing. And and Castellanos is a little bit higher up in the lineup, but not much. I think he's what hitting seventh most of the time right now. Yeah, sixth? and I would say I mean, the expectations for Nick Castellanos are, high, are a little higher than Johan Rojas too. Sure. Johan Rojas be. is in that lineup to hit enough that they can put him in center field as much as they want to. Nick Castellanos is there to play every day, to hit every day, to, to potentially be an all-star. I just He's keep going back it. to last year when he was in the playoffs and he just suddenly lost it in the NLCS. Is like, one day I was seeing the ball great, and the next day it went away. I was like, how, how does that happen? I just, I know it does, but it just boggles my mind. How does that happen? The, the, but the, but the bats are the bats, right? They're gonna, they're gonna hopefully come around at some point here in the near future. We kept saying, we said that for the first four months last year, and it wasn't until August that the bats came alive. But it was enough. It might be enough this time too. Hopefully not. Hopefully it's a different story. Hopefully, you know, Trey Turner is, is picks it up, and Schwarber has looked much better here in April. He has not been on vacation in April. He's hitting very well here in the early going. That's encouraging to see. But you mentioned it a little bit earlier in the show, Justin, the base running mistakes. These are the unacceptable things for a team that's a, as a veteran a team as this. That rundown that JT Real Muto and Bryce Harper tried to execute oh, on Lord. Saturday yes. against a worse opponent, that costs them a game because that's little league nonsense. That's ridiculous. Like, 
first of all, JT, dude, you can't get picked off. What do you? Why are you even trying to be frisky at first base with Bryce Harper at third and nobody out? Like, just I know the offense isn't coming through with he, runners in scoring position. Joe Mucho but, loves to see himself as a base runner. He loves to think he's a frisky guy, and he he is successful some of the time. But he takes a lot of risks because he. I think he has bought into his own bought into that myth of like I'm a great catcher, base runner. Like, no, you're a catcher. Stop. I mean, he is a fast base runner. I give him that. Yeah. But uh, mistakes like that are, like you're saying, John, they just, they can't happen. But honestly, I think this is part of the plan. This is, the Kyle Schwarber was, I'm serious, Kyle Schwarber was making reference to this. They want to, their whole thing is being aggressive. And when being aggressive doesn't work, that's what it looks like. You know, you're, yeah. you got your head thinking about your next move, not what you're currently doing. And that's exactly what you see. A veteran like Real Muto getting picked off? That's inexcusable. Like, in that situation, like you're saying, John, like, that's, what are you doing, man? You expect, like, a kid who's, who's got the, like, early, rookie game jitters, like, to get yeah. picked off, who's distracted. Real Muto's, you know. But, again, they're trying to be more aggressive. They want that to be a strength of theirs. And when it's not looking, it just looks sloppy. And they look sloppy. They're, yeah. what, 11 for 17 in stolen base attempts. And they are, they have been caught, they've made more outs on the bases than any other team. Yeah, they Which, are the best other outs something. on the bases. Yeah. yeah, tragic, tragically common feels like trend for this team and something that <laughs> mm -hmm. takes them out of a lot of games. Well, a lot of scoring opportunities just wasted with with these kinds of op and and they're not hitting well enough to waste those opportunities. That's the problem. Like if you're if you're the Atlanta Braves, you you can run into six outs on the bases and probably survive it. But when you're really struggling to barrel the baseball, when you're really struggling to hit the ball, and I will say, too, the Phillies have had their fair share of line outs over the course of the first week of the season, Bryce Harper specifically. In the ninth inning on Sunday, it looked like the, the Phillies, you know, a couple guys hit the ball hard and you hit them at people. That, that That's what happens. That's fine. But you've got to... I, and I like the aggressiveness, Liz. I like being aggressive on the bases. I think it's a good mindset to have, but it's got to be disciplined also, like a disciplined aggression. And they did this exact thing last year. Yeah. We had this conversation, like in the first month of the season, first two months of the season, the Phillies had created more outs on the bases than <laughs> any other team, and then they fixed it. They corrected it. It wasn't a problem during the last, like, four months of the season. But for the first two months, we were pulling our hair out well, because the same group of players was doing the same thing. So they've got to figure out a way to get – to to get if get get into a better mindset coming year out of spring training and, and just <laughs> the only way What's to that? fix this is year round baseball because <laughs> you give them time off and it's over you give them too much yeah. time off and it they're just finished you know like yeah. we're just I feel like there isn't actually a fine line between you know like a you know smart aggression and stupid aggression. I, I feel like it's not hard to figure out what that is. Yet the Phillies make it seem like they're just dancing all over it all the time. Whoopsie. Like, and they can't figure out which direction to go. Are we, you know, being too conservative? We do too, like, they can't find a mode to get into this early, which is if, real if frustrating. What's the number of base outs on the bases the Phillies could have right now that would make it be that would make it clear they were being aggressive, but was still an acceptable amount of times that they'd run into outs by being aggressive. Like what's, what's the number three. I would say, I, would say, I was going to say like two, I would say like in the first, cause we're just talking first nine games. Um, yeah. And we're not talking about caught stealings, caught stealings or something else. You, you do two two plans in the first nine games of the season, yeah. but, but you're, but you're just aggressive by nature. You get, I think over the long haul, you're going to feel like you're going to come out on the winning side of that ledger, but they can't keep Sixes. up this rate, right? This is this is just a confluence of this is just one of those times when there's a knot of bad stuff and it all it's all at once and then we'll get past it, right? This this can't yeah. be they can't keep up this rate for the rest of the year. It would be historically awful. Right. Well, and they and they won't. They didn't last year. They fixed it, or at least maybe luck reversed itself. You know, they 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 a couple times when they could have gotten into rundowns, you know, somebody makes a bad throw, you score, whatever. But it's um, it is certainly something that, um, you know, Schwarber said that they have to improve their base running. 
that it's not where they want it to be, but they want to keep the aggressive thought in their heads because they want to take that extra 90 feet whenever they can. That's a good, that's a good motto. That's a, aggression is good. I think most of the time that's going to play out well. Right now it's not, and they've just got to they've got to match that with a little bit of discipline and situational awareness, and just paying attention. Like Johan Rojas getting picked off, you know, earlier last week, that wasn't aggression. That was just being dumb. You know, so they've just got to be aware of what's going on around them. So last thing before we wrap up here, they took two out of three from the Nationals. I don't think they looked great, but they looked better than the Nationals, which is fine. You've got to be better than the team you're playing that weekend. You know, you don't need to look like a playoff team every single day. Just be better than the team you're playing and, and you're going to win baseball games. But do we think this team looked better over the weekend than they did in the first two series? Or did they just have a weaker opponent, Justin? Uh, I feel like they were somebody trying out a new game and they tried it at the hardest difficulty and were like, no, no. And then they switched it to normal thinking, all right, this I can play. And they st it still wasn't working. So they switched it to easy. And there they actually managed to find some success. You know, like this, they really did going from the Braves to the Reds to the Nationals see like, what kind of team can we beat in a series right now? And it turns out the Nationals. So the good news is, we don't have to have a week's worth of conversations about like how this team couldn't even beat the Nationals. You know, that's great. They cleared but that bar. If we yeah. are accepting, not accepting, if we are aware that this is how they're going to start uh, and have started every season, then, you know, playing a team like the Nationals is going to be a gift. You know, they're at least as good. And, and they won the games they needed to win to, to not make this a waste of everyone's time. But like I said, I'm not letting them off the hook for that for that. This should have been a sweep. It was, the Sunday matinee game was, you know, a 3 2 loss to the Horrendous. Nationals with this offense. Like, come on, guys. So yeah. I, I, I feel like playing a weaker opponent, let them squeak out, uh, make the mistakes they would typically make. I called, I said on uh, Friday that they were just getting out Phillies. The Nationals were making a lot of mistakes where, like, the call would be being made, and then the broadcaster, whoever it was, either team, would have to like suddenly shift to, oh, but he dropped it. Or like, oh, <laughs> yeah. but it slipped out of his hand. Oh, but, and it was like for both sides. So like each time the Phillies seemed to be doing the thing that cost them the game, the Nationals would be like, oh, and like fall down a staircase. <laughs> so I think playing a weaker opponent was uh, definitely the driving factor behind these wins this weekend. However, that's exactly who the Phillies need to be playing right now while the missiles are still priming. Yeah, Liz, I mean, I think that's I think that's very true. Yeah. This should have been a sweep, and they need to take advantage of these lesser teams when they play them because the schedule will turn at a, at a certain point. And this is a this Phillies team is better than the Nationals team. You got to sweep some series, especially like you said, it's a one run game. It's a three two loss. You can't score. Mackenzie Gore is a really good, talented young pitcher. There's no real shame in, in maybe having a little bit of a hard time with him, but that bullpen of the Nationals is not very good, and they just weren't competitive offensively in in, in those final and really these any of these three games. It was uh, it, it was a series win, but again, I agree with Justin. I don't think it was quite enough. What do you think? I think Trey Turner had like uh, uh, he I think he had really good numbers against Mackenzie Gore. I can't remember yeah, what did. they are, but yeah. like stuff like that is where was that? They said that uh, at. The uh, start of the broadcast on the Nationals broadcast, and I said, "Well, can't wait to watch him no hit the Phillies today, because that's <laughs> almost always what happens." Like when I saw the lineup and saw it was, you know, uh, Sosa did end up hitting a home run, but saw, you know, Merrifield, Sosa, and Pache at the bottom of the lineup. I thought, well, this definitely feels like a Sunday lineup. Definitely Man. feels like well, one. It turned out it was one, even though those two of those three guys actually contributed. I think it was after um, Schwarber got doubled up that Whit Merrifield finally like stepped up, then hit a single with the bases yeah. empty. Like, That's <laughs> of course, Useful. of yeah. course. Thank you. Yeah, that would have been more helpful. Another situation. What? Um, all right, let's finish up here uh, with some five. Well, first, let me just mention Phillies now go to St. Louis for a three-game series against the five and five Cardinals. You've got Spencer Turnbull against Miles Michaelis on Monday, Zach Wheeler uh, against um, some fellow named Thompson, which I was just pressing on his face to see exactly who that was. Uh, he's 0-2 with a 6.97 ERA here in the early going. Zach Thompson, lefty for St. Louis. And then on Wednesday, uh, the Phillies starter is TBD, uh, going up against Lance Lynn uh, for a Wednesday matinee against St. Louis. So that's what the Phillies have coming up here at the start of this next week. Uh, Liz, final thoughts from you to start things off tonight. For me. Um, 
just want to take a minute to pay respects to one of the greatest Philadelphians, Don Staley, who won another national championship uh, with South Carolina today, Sunday. Um, so just a, like one of the greatest Philadelphians of all time, I would say, up there with the likes of uh, other wonderful denizens of the city, Ben Franklin, other guys that I... That was I'm the only one, though. Yeah. Ben Franklin's the only one. Probably. There are other guys. It's late. It's a Sunday Rocky. night, and it's almost 10 o'clock. <laughs> yeah. Rocky. There's a statue of that guy. But The pretzel benders outside the yeah. vet back in the day. I mean, yeah. Don Staley, absolute queen. Uh, watching her coach was incredible. They... It didn't look like it on the score, but they really did just beat the crap out of Iowa and of Caitlin Clark. It was an inspiring, inspiring sight. So all love to Don Staley, the queen of Philadelphia. Yeah, and very cool how she thanked Caitlin Clark for elevating the sport after during the when they were on court uh, right before they cut down the nets and celebrating and everything. So she's a for sure a class act. It was it was very impressive performance by by South Carolina. I hadn't seen any games this year, but looked like they knew what they were doing uh, on, on Sunday <laughs> afternoon. So uh, congratulations to Don Staley and uh, the Gamecocks. All right, Justin, final thoughts from you, buddy. Well, I've probably had about enough City Connect jersey talk uh, for the year. That's that's We could probably shut that down, but I might also be covering the game for Baseball Perspectives on Friday when they debut them. So I just wanted to bring up that in all of our conversations about the jerseys being revealed, uh, along with the, you know, the full uniforms. Uh, I did not see the video of the actual debut at the Majestic store at the ballpark with the Fanatic. <laughs> when oh, they were yeah. booed. They were lustily booed <laughs> by the crowd. I did not see that. That's very funny. I don't even hate them as much as most people, and I thought that was very funny. <laughs> that was fun. They I mean, should and, have and known. Yeah, they, they should have known. Any if you're online at all, that was a <laughs> hey, Philly fans. Here's something. <laughs> here's something just that in be the... no way will match your expectations. No, no, <laughs> the energy was definitely going in a certain direction there. But I, it, it was, it was, it was fine. You know, you, you figure the Philly fanatic is going to take the, you know, you, you bring the Philly fanatic out, and you're automatically going to get a pop. It didn't happen uh, this last time. And there is an interesting story by Todd Zalecki about the leak of the jersey a few weeks ago. Uh, that basically somebody stole one of the jerseys out of a shipping container. Uh, and and posted it on eBay. Apparently, this happens a lot. Like with stuff that comes in, worker dock workers will just crack a box open and take one or two things out of it and seal it back up and then sell it on eBay. Well, it just happened to be the Phillies City Connect jersey being shipped over uh, before they got a chance to officially unveil it. So it could have been one of the powder, you know, the the powder blues. It could have been one of the creams. It instead it was the City Connect jersey. So um, yeah, try as you might. Sometimes stuff's just going to get out. Um, all right, everybody. Well, look, that's going to do it for episode number 800 of Hit and Season. Folks, thanks for joining us here on this episode of the podcast. I will direct you to our good friends at billypen.com slash hit and season. That's our landing page over there at Billy Penn, uh, where you can write the, we can read, not write the blog posts. Although if people wanted to write the blog posts, I would, I wouldn't mind outsourcing that every once in a while. Give them a shot. Yeah, but you can read the blog posts that go along with our podcasts over at billypen.com slash hit and season. Read all of Liz's great work over at uh, sports.yahoo.com and Justin at Baseball Prospectus and my stuff at The Good Fight as well. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll talk to you next time right here on Hit and Season.